The first talk is from Alan Griffiths, who's a UK separation product specialist at LECO, and this is a sponsored talk. So thanks again, LECO, for your support. Alan studied chemistry at the Manchester Metropolitan University and University of Toledo before pursuing a career in the music industry. So Alan then returned to science, working with Micromass as a test and installation engineer. So after eight years at Micromass, he joined LECO, where he works with TOFs and GCGC systems. And he's been with LECO for 15 years now. So Alan's talk is called The Timeline of Breath Analysis, A Brief History of When, Why, and How. Over to you, Alan. Thank you for that introduction. Thank you for the opportunity to present here today. Thank you all for listening. Today, I'm going to be talking about the elements of history of breath analysis, which begins as far back in time as medical notes have existed. Breath odor was used by the ancient Egyptians. Eastern medicine taught smell as one of the four pillars of evaluation and agreed with what Hippocrates taught his students, such as rotting smell suggesting lung disease. The history and the present research into breath analysis is way too vast to compress into 10 minutes. So I'll concentrate on the work leading up to and utilizing GC and GCGC top MS. That's gas chromatography and comprehensive gas chromatography hyphenated with time of flight mass spectrometry. The first GCMS was a GC top MS built in 1956 in Michigan by McLafferty and Golk. However, it wasn't until 1971 when Linus Pauling studied breath with a GCMS that the true complex nature of breath came into view. He used a single quadrupole GCMS because the data from the time of flight proved too vast and complex to work with. It wasn't until 1996 that a GC TOF MS capable of recording all the data was built and production of the Pegasus began at the Leco factory in Michigan. Even then, the amount of data recorded proved too vast for computers to process in reasonable time until in 2000, when the gigabit processor was invented. In the same year, Professor Seeley of Oakland University, Michigan, analyzed chemical mixtures with flow modulated GCGC FID, resolving complex data sets with computer power and complex matrices with chromatographic power took a huge leap forward in 2000. In 2002, LECO brought out the first GCGC TOF MS, the Pegasus 4D. I'm not going to go into the details of how GCGC works, but for the uninitiated, it's a method of injecting all the effluent from GC column into a different GC column, and so separating in a second dimension, thus vastly increasing chromatographic resolution and separating coalluting peaks. Professor Seeley utilized flow modulation whilst LECO's Pegasus 4D quadjet modulator used two liquid nitrogen cryotraps to refocus and trap analytes and two heaters to pass the analyte through the modulator and eject onto the second column. About the same time in Ann Arbor, Michigan, Mark Libidoni was building a different type of thermal modulator. Looking for a suitable complex test mixture, he chose breath and the first GCGC MS analysis of breath took place. Also in the same department was a Pegasus 3. They upgraded it to a PEG 4D on which his mentor Richard Sachs and Juan Sanchez analyzed the breath of smokers. Soon after and before his work was published, Libidoni joined Leco Separation Science Team in St. Joseph, Michigan. Unfortunately, Richard Sachs died before Libidoni's PhD paper was published. Research into disease is reliant upon research into instrumentation, and many of the early papers focus on this. Ralph Zimmerman's group at the Helmholtz Institute assessed multi-bed needle trap systems, and Michael Phillips worked on breath collection systems. With such complex field and so few researchers, papers were few in the 2000s. But Libidoni and Phillips did the rounds at conferences, drumming up interest with presentations and such. Dr. Phillips at PITCOM, Libidoni at the annual GCGC conference, ISCCE, and the ideal introduction to breath analysis for the uninitiated, Michael Phillips TEDx talk. Around 2011, Dr. Stephen Fowler in Manchester, England, used a Waters GC TOF MS to investigate chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And Sylvia Rocha's lab in Portugal followed up their single quad analysis of asthma breath 
with a PEG-4D yielding eight times the number of detected compounds to vastly improve their understanding. Asthma has become a focus for many labs utilizing time of flight mass spectrometry, including further work from Stephen Fowler with Roy Goodacre and Jeff Vacon's team in Liège, Belgium, although utilizing different ends of the TOF spectra, a GC TOFMS in Manchester and a GCGC high resolution TOFMS in Liège. Fowler and Goodacre's research with GC TOFs also extends to pneumonia, but at some point we must answer the question. Why do so many experts in breath analysis hyphenate GCGC with time of flight? Thermal GCGC produces very fine peaks, a tenth of a second wide, an ideal challenge for a fast TOF. So it was only natural that with full range spectra 200 times a second, the Pegasus would be utilized as a GCGC detector. Thus, coeluting peaks are separated by GCGC and fast TOF produces the complete fragmentation spectra for every peak. The latest instrument, the BT4D, records enough data points across a 0.1 second peak to reproduce accurate quantitation to boot. By 2013, Libidonia teamed up with Michael Phillips working on the influence of radiation chemotherapy on breath. Interestingly, the chemotherapy biomarkers should be very similar to those created by cosmic radiation, ideal for monitoring the health of astronauts on long voyages such as travel to Mars. They followed up their initial work on a single quad and compared single GC with GCGC on a PEG-4D and resolved over five times more peaks, five times more opportunities for biomarker discovery. All the breath analysis speakers at September's virtual GCGC symposium agreed that GCGC analysis of multiple patients in a study typically identifies 2,000 analytes. One of those speakers, Heather Bean, works closely with another of the previous speakers here, Jane Hill, collaborating on pneumonia and tuberculosis research, and also has teamed up with another of this year's speakers, Pierre-Hugues Stefanuto, part of Jeff Racont's team in Liège, which leads me onto high resolution mass spectrometry as they have an HRT 4D, 200 spectra per second, comprehensive chromatography in excess of 50,000 resolution, sub one PPM mass accuracy, and a mass range of up to one and a half thousand AMU. It is a beast. Many argue that GCGC provides by far enough data to work with and we've seen a five to eight fold increase in resolve peaks is typical. And I should add that the analytes identified in 1D will typically library match with 10 to 25% improvement when separated with GCGC. However, the addition of accurate mass can further increase confidence in identifications. So if budget constrains your options, GCGC TOFMS is an excellent solution for many approaches, especially in biomarker discovery. But if you can afford a GCGC high res MS, then get the best of both worlds. We have for the most part talked only about thermal modulation. There is also flow modulation, which brings us right back to 2000 when Professor Seeley was performing GCGC with his own bespoke flow modulator. Lico have since teamed up with them to design a new flow modulator. However, in breath analysis, no one that I'm aware of has worked with flow modulation GCGC hyphenated with TOFMS. However, there is still a missing piece of the puzzle. In 1956, the GC TOFMS was invented, but it wasn't until 1996 that the data was usable. 2000, when it was processable. GCGC complicates that story once again, and now accurate maths. The one thing left is the software to process all this data. Not only is the data complex, but for medical research, for biomarker discovery, sample data needs to be combined with potentially hundreds of other samples. So if you're interested in how LECO can assist your workflow and statistical solutions, then get in contact and let us show you the power of GCGC, time of flight, LECO patented deconvolution, and our latest LECO software. 
Now, there are many great researchers not mentioned here from Ranjan Nanda's work in India on gender dimorphism and tuberculosis to Audrey John's work on malaria. And my apologies to all those that I've missed. Now, what does the future hold? The soon to be released high resolution multimode source will also give electron ionization, positive chemical ionization and negative chemical ionization with perfect chromatographic alignment. As my daughter likes to say, epic. So thanks so much for that. I, I, I totally uh, agree that germ biomarker discovery, uh, you know, if you can maximize the amount of uh, VOCs and features that you can see, that increases your chances to find anything that's relevant. So you mentioned that, you know, there's five times more peaks uh, and about 2,000 uh, analytes, uh, which were detectable there. I'm just curious as to whether or not, so, so obviously there's peaks that show up on a chromatogram is a bit different from whether or not uh, those were VOCs uh, on breath. So I was wondering if any of uh, you or your uh, academic research partners I've tried to make that determination of um, what's on a breath versus what is just part of the uh, the blank or the uh, chemical noise, you know, from sample collection or on the instrumentation, uh, and whether and you know, is it two thousand compounds that are on breath, or is that everything that's uh, on the chromatogram? The two thousand uh, analytes that are that are that are spotted, the uh, features, um, are indeed everything. So when you start putting together multiple samples, um, so within clinical studies, as you well know, you're having hundreds, potentially hundreds of samples. When you start putting those together, the background things start dropping out. So as much as you come across 2000 within a study, there's a lot fewer that are repeated between each that, that become features that are usable within a clinical study, within uh, uh, breath diet, within uh, diagnosis and within um, identifying particular markers um, so that does reduce considerably and that's very much dependent on uh, the particular things that you're looking at and the details but you're looking much more in the hundreds when you get down to that kind of level obviously well not obviously but from what I was saying that in single GC you see less of them and then in GC GC you see a, a much broader range but yeah the, the full 2000 is that, that I wouldn't even say that the 2000 is off one breath sample that's when you're putting a lot of breath samples together you see a total of 2000 features typically brilliant thanks for that alan so we've got a few questions coming in first from paul thomas uh, how does one manage the differential aging of the columns it's the same as um any other gc uh so whatever methods you use whether you're using um peak tailing or whatever um your column uh, age is something which you should know from your particular understanding of GC. So each column is slightly different. Uh, typically within, uh, you will start to see uh, a degradation of the column. So you'll start to see column bleed, um, which uh, beautifully with GC, GC, the column bleed is taken away. So it doesn't interfere with your actual peaks anyway, um, but you can still see an increase in it. Um, as I said before, you see peak tailing. Peak tailing is also increased with GCGC, GC, so you get a really nice tail drop off and you can see if your peak tailing is starting to get too long and you know that it's time to, to change your column, et cetera. Just the usual man manners. There's nothing special about GCGC um, GC GC when it comes to replacing your columns. Got it, thanks. And then we have time for one last question from, from Thomas. Uh, so this is big equipment, lab science. Is there any prospect for miniaturization and handheld uh, instruments? There's a lot of companies out there that are going down this particular direction. In fact, some of the work that, that Alstone's doing with um, kind of Eno's technology, et cetera, is, is going in that direction. It's not something that Leco is looking at. What Leco works on is R&D kind of facilities, uh, kind of equipment that you can find those biomarkers. But in the future, there's going to be instruments that can be used within clinical environments, can be used within a, a surgery um, or whatever, so that you can just have an instant access to, to the results that you're after. Brilliant. Thanks for that, Alan. Yeah, no, I, to I totally agree. Once biomarkers have been discovered and validated and you want to translate to use, there's a range of different options there. And as you say, that's one of the things we at Alstone are focused on using our uh, microchip and mobility spectrometer. 
So excellent. Thanks so much, Alan. Really appreciate that. Uh, thanks Problem. for your contribution. Hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.